Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please take a seat. We're, we're going to start. Uh, my name is Christoph Bellman. I'm from ICTSD. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, session on negotiating farm goods in the new global market context. We have roughly two hours ahead of us. So I'm not going to make long uh, introductory remarks. Uh, maybe just a, a few words about uh, the meeting and what we're doing or what we're trying to do here. Um, as you know, we, we came back from, uh, from Nairobi with, uh, with an important agreement on, uh, on, on, on uh, export competition, uh, but also I would say with maybe a little bit of lack of clarity on what would be the next steps in uh, other elements of the reform process uh, mandated under Article 20 of the Agreement on Agriculture. Uh, we know that uh, we need uh, further negotiations on SSM, on uh, public stock holding. We know that there's a strong commitment by all members to advance negotiations on the remina remaining DDA issues, including the three pillars of the negotiations. But quite frankly, we don't really have a very clear roadmap in terms of what's coming next. Uh, we have uncertainty on the mandate and uh, probably uh, some divergent views on what should be the, f the basis for future uh, discussions. Now, after, after Nairobi, members have apparently expressed interest in some sort of a, an outcome on domestic support uh, between now and uh, MC11. Um, what this should entail remains unclear. Uh, so we thought that as we move forward or move from this period of reflection and hopefully towards a period of more action, uh, it might be a good time to just take a, a step back and, uh, and reassess some of the options to, uh, to move forward. We, we know what the different positions of the different countries are. They haven't really changed in, that, uh, in, in this area. Uh, and they've been articulated very clearly in the past, but they have been articulated essentially or framed under the overall DDA approach. Um, so it might be a good time to, uh, if not reassess some of these positions, at least re-examine them by focusing really on what were the underlying concerns and interest that informed those positions and all these interests in the negotiations, including going really commodity by commodity, what are the problems we're facing in all these different areas and what might be the, the way forward. In doing so, obviously, we need to take into account uh, evolutions in policies, reforms that have happened in a number of countries, but also changes in the economic realities, uh, changes in prices in particular. So that's basically the objective of the meeting, is, is, is to provide you with the kind of in analysis and information that should really underpin this, uh, this exercise. Uh, by looking at uh, critical commodities, uh, from a trade and a food security perspective, what has been the evolution uh, in support, particularly domestic support in those, in those commodities, and what might be a possible way forward to address uh, these challenges in future negotiations. So the goal is not to suggest any particular approach or course of action, but, uh, but really rather to provide the, the, the analysis and the tools uh, for uh, members to engage in a constructive discussion on, on, those, uh, on those issues. For this, we have uh, four very good speakers, and I suggest that I'll just give them the floor one after the other before we engage in a, in, in a discussion. Um, you have the agenda in your folder. You have a short biography for each of the speakers, so I will not introduce them in, uh, in details in the interest of time. Um, so if this is fine with you, uh, without further ado, I will immediately start with uh, uh, Ahmad Mukhtar from, uh, from FAO, who's going to talk about uh, helping us identify a little bit which are the products that are particularly important from a food security perspective. While we're still uh, setting up the, the PowerPoint, just one little uh, housekeeping announcement. As you have seen, we have uh, cameras here uh, broadcasting uh, the event. They will only film the presentations, and once the presentations are over, uh, we will we'll cut them uh, in, in order to have a kind of more free-floating uh, discussion. So with this, Ahmed, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks for the invitation. ICTS3 is always proactive in all of those issues. It's a good initiative. Um, I would basically start with, as Christoph said, getting back to the basics. Um, as you know, FAO is a food and agriculture organization, so we would just give you some reflection, some facts and figures, where do we stand in some of the food items? And then the other speakers would take from that point onwards. Um, I mean, this is a short list that would be more or less covered in today's uh, presentation, but most of the times as ag negotiators, you would see that these are the agriculture products which come into limelight uh, most of the times when we talk about the trade or production or consumption of different uh, agriculture items. Now, the first issue is that what do we eat? I mean, what do we consume in terms of food? Um, this is one of the FAO's infographics, which gives a fair idea that, uh, interestingly, the major portion that we do in the top uh, that we consume is cereals, uh, wheat, rice, and so on and so forth. But in the next some of the next slides you would see that interestingly cereals are not the most traded commodities at the same time. That's another fact. These are the most consumed but not essentially most traded. Um, of course followed by the vegetable oils, meat, milk, dairy and so on and so forth. Uh, you would have all of these uh, uh, as, as co in, in the copy of the presentation. Uh, so essentially it is the plants that provide about 80% of our food or energy intakes. So when we talk about agriculture products, uh, we are talking about majority of the plants and cereals, um, and rest, about 20%, goes to the livestock, fats, and other fat sources. Um, however, at the same time, since we are FAO, we have to say that uh, it is of a huge concern that a lot of food is wasted as well, uh, as much as 35% in some countries is wasted. Um, another narrative that we must say as FAO is that although livestock and meat is getting bigger in terms of the energy intake in many of the countries, uh, it does have some of the environmental concerns. And we have some reports where you can go into details. So now going to the top 10 agriculture products, in this chart you will see that the list from left to right is um, starting with the highest value, highest production value, and interestingly, it is the milk that has the highest value, followed by rice, then meat, uh, uh, three meats, uh, pig, cattle, and chicken, and then wheat and soya, soya, and so on and so forth. However, if you look at the, the list from the quantity perspective, which is the blue bar that you can see, interestingly, it is sugar cane that leads the list, followed by wheat, rice, and then um, milk and soya. So, I mean, as, as ag, ag negotiator, one has to see that where are we putting our negotiating capital in terms of gaining the value. Um, another interesting fact that is observed in last, I mean, last means the data, the latest official data that we have is until 2013. So between 2000 and 2013, you would see that interestingly, most of the growth in agriculture production happened in Africa followed by Asia. Um, in Africa, the most important fact is that the area harvested has increased the most in Africa, followed by Asia, and interestingly, it has gone down in Europe. If you look at the total value of production, again, the growth rate, and this is the growth rate, uh, annual, annual uh, percentage growth rate, Africa leads, followed by Asia, and then Americas and Oceania. Um, However, if we see the yield, then more or less Africa, Americas, and Asia, and Europe are more or less equal. The Oceania is a little bit far, uh, a little bit below in terms of yield uh, growths. Now, another very interesting fact, which is based on our common OECD FAO joint publication that you might have seen, we do the uh, uh, 20, I mean, uh, 15 years outlooks and uh, yearly and biannual outlooks. So one fact that I, th I thought would be quite interesting for the uh, negotiators here, blue bar is basically the annual percentage growth in volume terms of different products. So you would see that in the first, the, in the crops group, more or less the growth was in soya bean, rice, wheat that we had witnessed in previous years. And this, sorry, this uh, blue growth, uh, blue bar represents the growth between 2006 and 2015. And then more or less in meat, there was growth as well, followed by the dairy and biofuels. 
However, interestingly, the gray bar, which represents 2016 to 2025, for the next 10 years, you would see that the growth in trade of these products is going to be slower or lesser than the previous decade. So that's a point to be noted that most probably, as, and then again, these are the forecasts and the estimates. It may not be exactly true, but based on the facts and figures, uh, except some of the outliers. For example, in sugar, uh, the growth could be more or less same. In biofuels, understandably, this would go down because biofuel had its own climax for some years, but uh, no more um, in the next years. Uh, so this would give you a snapshot that largely, in general, when we hear that the trade could be shrinking, uh, it could be true for the agriculture products as well. Now, this is a small balance sheet of the uh, wheat situation, which is one of the most important ones uh, in, in terms of cereal. Um, I mean, you can see the facts and figures. These are the latest production figures and the forecasts. But one interesting fact to be noticed in the cereals is if you look at the production, for example, the latest production is 732, uh, and these are the million, uh, thousands of the uh, millions of the ton, a million tons. Um, but if you see the trade, that's just 158. So if you look at the trade to production ratio, it is not very high in, in most of the cereals, and we'll see in rice as well. And so that's the situation in race. And you would see that the stocks, the ending stocks, which is the last line in the first, um, first half of the matrix, the stocks are going high. That means overall, either the production is getting up, which is true as well, but at the same time, trade may not be very encouraging in the recent times. Let's move to rice over here. Situation is more or less same. We have production close to 500, uh, but the trade is almost 10% or 9% factually speaking. So when we talk about rice in terms of the sensitivities and others, we should keep in mind that the traded stocks are not really very significant as of now. And again, the stocks are, uh, uh, I mean, in, in some years they were quite high, but now going down. Uh, I did not cover the prices because we would focus more on the subsidies part. But if you look at the overall prices, there is another trend that um, on a log scale, these are going down now, or mm. would be going down in, in next 10 years. Uh, a very short snapshot of some of the others. For example, for maize, you will see that the largest producers remain largest, and there's a huge difference in one or two countries versus the rest of the world. So maize is largely dominated by the Americas. We know uh, two or three countries in Americas are significant, uh, followed by Asia, and then Europe and Oceania. Uh, soybean is more or less same. It's heavily dominated by the Americas region. Prediction is um, almost uh, continuously going up. Uh, the first graph is global production, and then second is the um, regional distribution of the production. Uh, then we go to the beef, which is largely dominated by five top producers. They have been there for last 20 years, more or less in the same proportion, except that China is coming up now as a big beef producer, uh, largely due to the enhanced consumption or domestic consumption in country. Uh, so it, it looks likely that in beef, Asia would be coming up quite significant as a producer. Uh, same for the poultry. Uh, Americas uh, are dominating Brazil, US, and others, um, followed by Asia and then Europe. Interesting, one interesting fact in the, in the foods uh, is from the consumption part. You'll see that a lot of fruit consumption happens in Asia, interestingly. Um, I had to cut the slides due to time, but production, I mean, this is one of the most traded, let's say, product groups over here. And interestingly, uh, we would not hear a lot of so-called sensitivities except the bananas when we talk about the negotiations in agriculture trade. Um, and in Asia, again, you know, it, it is largely consumed for uh, the food supply, not the feed. Of course, fruit is mostly the food, but it is wasted as well to a certain extent, the purple bar that you could see. Now, the vegetables, again, um, it is, of course, Asia's large producer as well, but it is the largest consumer and would be growing. Uh, we'll see in a couple of next graphs that Asia is the market, and this is one of the items. Uh, by the way, if for the fruits and vegetables, we have to keep in mind that these are the items which are mostly subject to SPS restrictions or non-tariff measures as well. So these are um, these needs to be 
given special concentration. Now, this is one of the most important segments, I think, we have to see that where the world is leading. In the left, left-hand chart, you would see that where are we getting our calories from? That means what are we eating now in different parts of the world? Sorry, this was only black and white. I tried to get from the WHO the color one, but could not get. Um, the thing is that uh, I hope you can see. Do we have any laser pointer here? Anyways, um, you'll see that in these years, uh, from let's say 60s, the decade of 60s up to 90s, we had an increase in rice production, which is largely, and we are talking about developing countries, by the way, not globally, which was uh, a function of increased production in Southeast Asian countries. However, interestingly, if you look at 2030, uh, in terms of the total food intake or the food, let's say, average food consumption pattern, the rice is going to be less. You can see over here. Uh, now, what would be growing more in terms of developing countries? It is the wheat, the second segment that you see. It was less in trees and a little bit increase here as well, into it, up to 2030, in the next 15 years. Uh, the next in, uh, significant increase would be um, in the vegetable oils. Uh, we are talking about the whole food intake. Uh, so soya, sunflower, and these type of things would increase. That is this one. You'll see it it would almost triple in a way from previous decades in the next couple of decades. So what we see is that we have a changing pattern of food consumption in developing countries, which is basically the major importing segment of the agriculture products. And there is a shifting pattern. Now that, <coughs> and these uh, vegetable oils and the livestock is also coupled with the right-hand graph. Uh, just to explain a little bit further, you would see that in in case of developing countries, the dependency on cereals, which is overall cereals, rice, wheat, and all of uh, the other cereals, is going down interestingly. You'll see that from 69 to 70, I mean, these are the representative periods. And right now, I mean, up to 20, uh, in the next um, 15 years, you will see that there is a drop in consumption of cereals. Uh, which again substantiate the first graph that probably the trade in rice, wheat, etc., would not be significant in next years. Uh, for the rest of the world, for the industrialized countries, the composition or the usage of cereals is more or less stagnant. Um, uh, and globally, it, it's downward trend, but a little bit downward trend. Majority goes to the developing countries uh, when we talk about the uh, the decrease in dependency on cereals, which of course would have implications on the production and the trade, uh, etc. Um, now, one of the last slides is about the livestock. From trade perspective, one has to keep in mind that cereals is more or less stagnant in terms of prices, in terms of the demands and everything. But one segment that is increasing in the agriculture is livestock. Now, if you look at the red part, sorry, um, the red segment in this one, you would notice that in the meat part, back in 60s, the per capita consumption in the developing countries was about 10 kilos per person. Uh, recently, it went up to 25. But what are we expecting in the next 15 years is almost triple of the 60s and 70s. So there's a huge increase. And when we say developing countries, we know that we are talking about more than 70% of the population. and overall consumption and so on and so forth. Uh, um, and then uh, the same trend in the milk, it was 28 back in 60s. Uh, in the late 90s, went to 44, and now it would be in the next years up to 65 uh, kilos or the liters. I think it should have been in liters, but it is denominated in kilos uh, per person. So there's a huge increase. And if you would remember the first graph uh, by production value, which product was highest? It was milk, followed by the meats. So I should not say anything more than that. The rest is up to you. Um, in the sub-Saharan Africa, interestingly, you'll see that we are not increasing much in terms of, although one would say that that, that was the area which is developing and growing, but uh, it's not very significant increase. And of course, in the um, in developing countries, and I mean, you'll see the other groups are more or less stagnant or having a natural increase. Uh, one point to be noted is the South Asian region from the developing countries. 
uh, because South Asia is 2 billion people roughly, um, and they have a huge increase expected in the next 15 years, both in meat and milk category. So one would expect a lot of trade flows as well because the domestic consumption patterns in the region are not really very healthy to meet this demand. So what we are expecting is a strong inflow of these livestock products, the South Asian region in particular out of the developing countries. So that was more or less a snapshot. Um, we had a short time for all of the further details. You can contact us or go to the FAO statistics. Um, there are plenty of things. We soon would be having a new version of the state of food insecurity in the world, which would have all of these things in detail. And since there is an embargo, we could not share anything as of now. <laughs> but hopefully you'll have some further details. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Ahmad, for this, uh, this quick overview. I know it's a bit of a challenge to cover so much ground in, in, in such a short amount of time. But as you said, we, you have a much longer uh, PowerPoint, which yes, is available exactly. on, the, on, on the web with, uh, with a lot of uh, very interesting details. So thanks a lot, particularly for looking a little bit into the future. Uh, let's now move to um, uh, Jared Greenville from the, from the OECD, who is going to uh, focus more specifically on uh, distortions uh, affecting agricultural products uh, and uh, global uh, trade patterns. Jared, you have the floor. Excellent. Thanks, Christoph. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming along. Um, and thank to the ICTSD for inviting me. Um, and good afternoon. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is really take, a, as, as Christoph mentioned, a bit of a commodity focus. And I'm going to focus in on domestic support um, that's provided to, to agriculture, um, and in particular to particular commodities within agriculture. Look at some of the changes over time. Look at who is pro providing that support. And then look at the relationship between who is providing that support, the commodities, and how much of that is uh, trading, and what are the potential influences. Um, I'll have a look at the, some of the impacts of the policies, potentially on agro-food trade um, and markets, and hint at and have a look at some of the, the issues that might be around um, reforms in that area. Um, the data that I'm going to talk about predominantly comes from the OECD producer support estimate data. Um, now, this is a database that seeks to measure the economic distortions associated with government policy in support to, to agriculture. So it's distinct from the AMS type measures that, that are used down here. Um, the database covers roughly around 85% of gross value of agricultural production. Um, or value added, I should say, but it's about 65% of total value of production. So we have pretty much all the major agricultural producers except for India included in the database. So it's re relatively representative. Um, to cover off some of those gaps, I'm also going to draw on some, some data from the World Bank Nominal Rate of Assistance database. Um, and to conclude, the, the modelling that I'll present, I'll put the caveat out that it represents the author, my um, opinions are not necessarily those of the OECD. So jumping in. Um, one thing to, I guess, to note when we, we look at this producer support data is that we, we differentiate the support that's measured between that that's targeted to, towards particular commodities and that that's pr provided to the sector in an untargeted way. And we say, well, we look at that which is provided directly to producers and that which is uh, a general services type infrastructure, R&D and so forth. Um, I'm going to focus on the, the support that's targeted to producers that basically you can think of as payments going to the, the actual producers themselves rather than in supplying those services like infrastructure and R&D which go to the sector but not to, towards individual producers um, themselves. Um, when we look at this data what we see is that the, the share of that amount that goes directly to producers that is targeted towards individual commodities or individual um, producers is about 45%. So we say that the, the targeted, the, the single commodity transfers in this, what we use, um, is about 45% of the total support that goes directly to producers. Um, so there's still a, a range of other universal support. You might think of it as, as fertiliser subsidies that don't have uh, production activity um, that's mandated and so forth that goes on. So I'm going to go into this 45% a little bit more detail. 
When we look at that 45%, it turns out that around five products account for 75% of that support. So governments across the world are, are really targeting their individual support to five key products, and they relate to, to maize, to rice, to pork, beef, and to dairy. Um, and what we see is that over time, in terms of real spend, and this is in US dollars, it's been relatively flat. So the absolute money that's going towards these commodities from governments over time is, has remained fairly flat. Um, there hasn't been, as you see, so much reform. Um, for some, there's, there's a bit of a trend down. Um, but for others, it's, it's flat. To, but what, what is noticeable is that, particularly over this recent period, it's flat to increasing. The, if we want to just broaden out, um, as Amon put up, there's a, there's a range of other important crops for, for trade and for food security, and these are the other crops which account for a large share of, of that remaining amount that's single commodity, um, but are much, much less. And we see that, again, there's this flat, flat trend that's, that's occurring over time, um, but with some recent creeping in, in the level of support. Um, going up, and there's obviously there's mixes in there between the different different commodities, but unlike what we've seen in in some of the other overall measures, when we look at them, that there's there doesn't seem to be this decrease in, in activity that's directed towards these different commodities. There is some good news slightly to it when we look at the changes in relative terms, and so now this is just representing those those important crops and I've added cotton um, for interest um, that when we look at the share of that support that's provided in the total value uh, that's created by production and those activities we see that there has been for some commodities uh, a general decrease over time so the intensity of that support is falling a little bit but really in in recent years it's been relatively flat um, and for some commodities such as cotton, it's, it's been gradually increasing. So then the question is, who is providing this support? And so when we look at support overall and we look at it in, in relative terms, we see that in terms of the, the relative um, size of the support to the agricultural, the domestic agriculture sectors, it's still a number of the OECD countries that are, are heavily supporting their sectors. And the Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, Korea and Japan um, have very high rates of, of producer support um, relative to the value of production. However, over time there has been some convergence between some of the emerging countries, in particular that of China and that of Indonesia, towards some of the, the OECD countries. And we see that now Indonesia and China are the next two countries that follow up from those OECD countries that I mentioned. And both in the latest year, Indonesia and China actually are spending around to above the OECD average um, in terms of the support that they're providing to agriculture. Um, within the OECD, there's been contrasting trends. Um, Norway, Switzerland and Iceland, there's been relatively little change over time. Um, but some of the larger um, groupings, in particular the EU, has seen a decrease in, in the level, the intensity of its support. So when we take our focus back to those five commodities that I put up there that really seem to be the focus of, of different countries' policies, and sorry, this is all a bit messy, um, but what we see, for particularly for rice, maize and pork, is that in absolute spend terms, China dominates the picture here. Um, so the absolute um, f support levels that are going to the sector um, is, is dominated by actions of China. Um, and that's largely because of two effects. I mean, China, China is a very large country. It's the world's largest agricultural producer. So there's a sheer size effect here. Um, and so if we go back to the other, other slide we saw in percentage terms, it was not too much different from the OECD average. So there's a size effect, but there's also a policy effect. And so the type of policies that they have in play towards agriculture are more directed at individual commodities and, and some of these. So there's a policy and size effect. Um, for rice, the other major players you see there are Indonesia and Korea um, and Japan. Um, for maize, we also have um, Indonesia and the United States um, spending significant amounts or accounting for a significant share of that, 
that pie that's been spent on those products. Now these countries that I've mentioned, we all know, they're all significant agriculture traders as well and significant agricultural producers. Um, so they're likely to be, this, these policies are also likely to be influencing markets and, and trade outcomes, and we'll come back to that. When we look at the other two as well as cotton, we see a, a bit of a varied, more varied picture, um, particularly for beef and dairy. Um, and when we look at beef and dairy, there's a lot more OECD countries getting in on the act. Um, and so we see that the EU in particular, another large market, um, is involved in both beef and dairy. Um, Canada in dairy and the US um, is, is also playing a role. So we see a more varied picture. So there's a number of different countries whose policies are starting to, to influence those markets. Um, but again, most of those countries you'll, you'll look at and you realise that they are major agricultural producers and traders. Um, in terms of cotton, again, China, it's a China story, um, with the US also playing uh, a role in terms of the support that's provided to cotton, directly to cotton. So when we say, as I mentioned at the front, that the OECD PSC data doesn't cover every country, so I thought I'd try and broaden out and take a bit of a, a look at, at a broader data set, and this relates to the World Bank's nominal rate of assistance. And so just to get an idea of what's related more to domestic support as opposed to what's related from, from trade and market access concerns, um, I looked at the support levels that were provided by the top 10 um, major agricultural traders, both importers and exporters, compared to the rest, and just focusing on those output subsidies. This represents essentially a, a price markup that's created or a, 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 a benefit from, from support. So you get 20% of your revenues if it's 0.2 from, from output up to 100% in, in, in the one case. But what's, what's interesting to note is that the major traders are also supplying or, or providing more support to their producers than the non-major traders. Again, this, this link back um, to, to, the, to, to the potential influence on markets. Um, but there has been a, a shift, a trend downwards over time, at least in output subsidies. But also when we look at the mix of commodities that the, national, the nominal rates of assistance data tells us, we, we see the same names come up. Um, again, we've got rice, pork, dairy, beef has been major, major recipients of the support. Um, and what we see, although the data is not as long, um, is that it, it, there's, there's again this creeping trend towards the end. So one other thing before I finish on, on the kind of the background of the support story is, is just something to keep in the back of the mind is that it's not just all about domestic support. Um, when we take a look at those same commodities again, they also happen to be the commodities which have a greater level of tariff protection as well. Um, and so the black, solid black line there is the average for agro-food across so all products. But what we see is for a number of those products, particularly those key supported commodities, um, is that the average applied tariffs on trade um, is higher. Um, and also, it's, it's, again, it's been fairly flat um, over time. So these, there's not much action happening on, on some of these, these products. So then when we think now, going back to trade, I've made some, some comments about that these are major traders, the major commodities and so forth. I'm going to put up some good statistics to, to, so I can just touch on this. But those top five commodities count for a very large share of, of total agro-food trade. So those five that I mentioned at the start, which, are, um, which were highlighted in the PSE database, account for around 20% of total agro-food trade. Um, and it's been fairly flat. And when we expand to the, the broader set, the, the larger set of commodities, it's up around 47%. So the, they're heavily traded, in, but maybe not in intensity, but they represent a large share of trade and they also um, represent a large share of government attention. What we also note, and, and I'm going to put this up, is that these products, trade in these products have been growing over time as well. So the potential for these policies to influence markets is growing. And we're not seeing so much policy action in relative terms, but we're seeing the trade increase. So there's, there's a growing, I suppose, potential for distortion to, to occur. So the next question really becomes, 
you know, what if we didn't have these policies? What if these policies weren't there? What would be maybe some of the potential effects that occur for agricultural markets, for welfare um, and so forth? And so I'll just touch on a couple of findings that we, we have some, from some work that we've done. Um, we've initially done some work that looks at both the tariff and the domestic support um, impacts of, of current policies. And what we found is that if current policies were removed, both sets, that world production would be higher, trade would be higher, and also welfare, as we measured by household consumption, would also be higher. So these policies are having a number of negative effects um, on, on world agricultural markets and also on households. Um, what we also found is when we looked at some, some reform scenarios is that it's better together in the sense that you, the, the actions that are more uniform across countries yield higher gains. And importantly, what we found was that the, the effects that of, of policies and of reform on developing countries is, is mostly and more critically related to the policy actions that occur in developing countries. This kind of rise of South South trade, and that came up in some of Ahmed's um, background. So then this is more of the, the speculative author-driven results. I wanted to ask the question, well, what if it's just about domestic support? Let's, let's put aside the, the market access story for a moment. Um, and then if we just look at the domestic support side, and then when I'm talking about domestic support here, it's about the input and output subsidies, basically. Um, what if they weren't used? Not, what would be the effects on trade? And what it turns out is that reforming domestic support has the potential to grow trade. It's potentially it's a step in, in the direction towards more open markets. So we see the potential for agro-food trade to grow. Um, and when we look at those five top commodities, we see for, for four of them, we would expect trade volumes to, to increase. Um, the blanked out ones there, I would suggest you, you just ignore because it's a, a low trade volume over a low base percentage change. Um, but what we see is that these domestic support policies are having an influence on world markets. And when we look at welfare, which I haven't presented, they're also having a negative impact on, on global welfare. Um, and so what we're seeing is that these policies are having a reallocation in activity and, 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 and price and, and market effects. We've also done some work looking at the effect that domestic support has on global value chains in the agro-food sector. Um, and the reason we're interested in global value change is because for other sectors and for agriculture as a whole, they've been associated with income and productivity growth for the for this sector. Um, and so what's been shown is that increased involvement in, in GVCs has led to productivity and, and income growth. And so we were interested to know, well, what determines some of the participation, why people get involved in, in global value chains and what then influences domestic value added that's generated, so the benefits from, from being in, involved. And what we found is when we looked at the PSC s categories of support that I mentioned before, the, the ones to producers and the ones generally to agriculture, and we split up the ones to producers between the distorting levels of support and those that are at least distorting, they're more like household non-production linked payments. We found that the non-distorting policies, particularly the general support policy, um, was, had a positive influence on GVC participation. And particularly for R&D, which I haven't shown, it had a positive increase on the returns that you got from actually being involved, the domestic value added. What we found is that the distorting form of support, it did lead to higher in engagement in forwards um, participation. That means selling into to, to GVCs. But what it had was a negative effect on the return that you got from it. So you sold more into it, but you earned less. Um, and so it's important for, in, in a way, for, for getting the most out of, of the benefits you can have and for participating in GVCs that the support was, was essentially non-distorting. So I'm going to finish there um, and just leave with a couple of key messages um, wrapping up the talk. Um, and, and they really relate to, and I don't necessarily talk to them, um, what, I've, what I've mentioned. Um, one thing, and I'll just mention the last one, is that we talk about domestic support, and I agree it's important, but market access should also not be neglected, um, and I'll put that, it's better together. <coughs> well, thanks a lot, uh, Jared. Um, let's move now to... Um, oh, thanks. Do you need that?
No. Uh, so let m let's move to, uh, to Ulla, uh, who has a low-tech presentation yes, okay. <laughs> and uh, who's going to talk about uh, how do uh, current WTO frameworks address distorting, uh, distortions for specific farm products. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just first, um, when, when Jonathan kindly asked me to talk about uh, what is the title, how to current WTO frameworks address distortion for specific farm goods, is it easy? You know, I know it inside out, I can easily do a presentation. And once I accepted, he told me, but actually this time we limited the invitation to only specialists because we ha want to have a informed debate afterwards. And then I was like, what on earth am I going to tell to specialists about the existing agreement, right? So here I am. So what I tried to do is I talk, uh, I tried to, um, I put an extra effort in it to hopefully present the exi existing disciplines to you maybe under a different angle, or, or at least I try to refresh uh, your memory or certain things that happened in the past, so hopefully you will, you will, um, you will walk out with at least uh, a way of, a different way of seeing certain things you know uh, right now. So I will basically, what I uh, talk a bit, uh, as I said, about current pro uh, provisions and then lessons from the past, basically the end of Tokyo round, the beginning of the Uruguay round, if there is something we can learn from there. So it was very, uh, uh, one thing just to remind you also what the WTO, so what do we do? One thing what we do, and I think people start to take it for granted when you listen to Jared's presentation, he talked about subsidies, he talked about tariffs. He didn't talk about variable levies, minimum import prices, minimum export prices, voluntary export restraints, and so on. Why? Because these are forbidden. So this is, you don't see it on a daily basis, but this is also what we do. We, we have been forbidding some of the most trade distorting measures and they no longer exist. So keep that in mind because otherwise it just gives an impression that we don't do anything, but these measures do not exist because no longer exist because we exist. So what did the Uruguay round, exactly Uruguay round, eliminated all these trade distorting measures and the way of seeing the Uruguay round agreement is maybe it defines the policy space and defines the tools that are in the policy space. So in the, uh, in the current tools, what you have is actually a super limited as compared to the past. And I'm talking about trade distorting tools, right? That those that need to be disciplined. So we have uh, under market access, we have tariffs, we have special safeguards, we have TRQs, even though I wouldn't put it that in, in the category of tools, and I tell you why. We have subsidies, and we have still export subsidies. Um, uh, so why I, on the market access, I know that most of the people, at least when, when I, I talk to people outside the WTO, they consider TRQ as a tool, um, um, to limit imports. I still want to stress, I, I, I'm sure you know, but from the WT point of view, TRQs is an obligation to open your market. So it's not the tool to restrict your, restrict your imports. It's an obligation to open up your market, give minimum access, and as you know very well in Pali, who wanted the TRQ uh, decision? They were exporting countries, which shows that these an interest for exporting countries because we have to, uh, TRQs at the WTOs are there to open the market, not to close. So uh, if you think of those measures, whether it's tariffs or export subsidies, they are all product specific, right? So what we do is product specific, uh, export subsidies, already the entitlements were all product specific, unlike domestic support. But even in the domi under domestic support, as some countries know so well, we have those who do not have access to AMS, they are subject to product-specific de minimis. So you can argue that these countries do have a product-specific uh, limits on AMS. 
Now, um, I was just thinking this morning, and feel free to contradict me, but also AMS, just to introduce as a concept, you could see AMS, for those countries who have, as a kind of anti-subsidy concentration provision, right? Because for those who have AMS, um, you can, uh, they can go with their product-specific support above their product-specific uh, product de minimis limit, but the sum of those supports cannot go above the AMS limit. I don't say it's constraining, don't get me wrong. It's just a conceptual exercise because you could see some members have been talking about anti-subsidy concentration clause. As a, con as a concept, you consider this, that there is, AMS does have this aspect. So what, the, what I did in Nairobi do, and most of you were there, so you're well placed to know, but Nairobi took out yet another tool from the toolbox, right? Export subsidies, the entitlements, we are going to eliminate them. All these entitlements are product specific, and I looked at our documents, so there are 428 export subsidy commitments, out of which 421 are product specific. And if you looked at the product coverage uh, of those export subsidy entitlements, well, all the products um, uh, that have these export subsidy uh, entitlements are the products that on the first slide presented by the FAO. All products that are important for the food security from the food security point of view. So cereals, dairy, meats, sugar, cotton, fruits, and vegetables. So exactly the same. So I was very glad to see that first slide because I can say that what we did is in Nairobi, we eliminated this product specific uh, uh, export subsidy entitlements. So now, uh, obviously, after Nairobi, members are left with this toolbox where there's less tools in it. Um, within this toolbox, you can take uh, more protectionist or interventionist uh, policies uh, using the, your subsidies to the maximum limit, using your tariffs to the maximum limit, or not. This policy space is there, and that's members' responsibility how they use that policy space. A lot depends on the relative importance of different objectives. And the objectives for some countries, food security is more important. For some other countries, maybe it's environment that is more important. All these objectives are important for all countries, but what I try to say, the relative importance is different, and obviously the choice of policy tools goes with, a, with the weight you, you, you give to different uh, uh, policy objectives. Now, the one other thing we do is, like, why we even can talk about these measures, it's because I think WTO has done uh, quite a lot for the transparency, and I don't think I have to to explain to you what does it mean. You, you, you go to the, all the committees, you've seen the track record with notifications going up, uh, you can ask your questions, you get the answers or not, but usually you do. Uh, but there is a lot of effort that has put in the transparency. We had now a transparency day this week. And let's not forget about the monitoring we have. It's a trade policy review division that is responsible for monitoring. Um, so um, I looked at their statistics. So there have been uh, since 2009, because it's operational since 2009. Since 2009, there have been 19 WTO-wide reports. And they have recorded uh, almost 3,000 trade restrictive measures. But very important, this process, uh, this monitoring mechanism, it doesn't record only trade restrictive measures. They also record uh, the trade uh, liberalization measures. So they are more, more or less uh, since 2009, beginning of 2009, they have also recorded more or less almost 2,000 measures to facilitate trade. 
So the word monitoring, obviously, most see it more like policing, but actually it's really monitoring the situation and recording both trade restrictive measures and trade liberalization measures taken by, by countries. Uh, obviously, as you all know, there are all kinds of, uh, if you still think that members, your trading partners do not do enough with, uh, with their trade policy, uh, with their um, uh, with the policies or are, uh, or too interventionist, you 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 have several um, tools available, uh, which you know them as well as I do. Uh, countervailing duties, uh, anti-dumping duties, whatever that the uh, the, the um, your concern. There is a way, and if you really don't find anything, there is a dispute settlement. Uh, and uh, mo I'm sure most of you know, but uh, just to remind you that even all, ma all subsidies that are, um, all subsidies that respect the criteria of uh, the agreement of agriculture can still be challenged on this, the subsidies agreement. So, so it's, uh, it's an additional, um, uh, additional tool for you to protect your interest, even against the measures that are WTO consistent. Yeah. So, um, from the past, for AMS, AMS, as I said, it's the only measure that is not really product specific, with the exception of product specific uh, de minimis, but. Um, just to know that the attempt to make it product specific was, is not anything new. It was already in the Uruguay round, actually the Dunkel text, it was product specific. And it got taken out uh, quite at the end of the round and was made general because time was obviously not ripe to make it product specific. So, um, there have been new trends, though, recently, and uh, you can see it from the accession protocols. So uh, from the accession, as you can see, the first time ever, and I'm pretty sure it's the only time we have products specific, the anti-subsidy concentration that steps in, it's in the Russian accession protocol. So Russia has in its accession pro protocol that its product specific support should not exceed 30% of the agriculture support that is not product specific. Uh, but it's a, it's a temporary uh, clause, so it will uh, finish in December 2017. But it was the first time ever that we actually brought in an anti-subsidy concentration clause in the accession pro protocol. Russia was also, in the case, Russia is a good example because Russia also has commitments in, in uh, in its schedule, uh, in, this, in its accession protocol on export taxes. Okay? Russia has uh, uh, committed to eliminate a certain number of export taxes. So this is also very, uh, um, it's a new, um, new thing at the WTO that we discipline uh, export taxes. It was also in Chinese protocol of accession, but it has been done only with the newly acceding countries. So, uh, coming back, what, what else can we learn from the past? Um, just because I, I've, been, um, I, I've been having questions about, and honestly, I was not very competent on the issue, so I went back and did some studying on the two, um, two product uh, plurilateral agreements that concerned agriculture products, which were dairy agreement and meat agreement. Um, just, just to see what was in there, and is there something we can learn for the way forward? So, uh, as you know, um, these were the um, plurilateral agreements, but actually the WTO plurilateral agreements. But actually, what they did was they basically, without any substantive modification, took over the two arrangements that existed uh, under the Tokyo Round that were in place since uh, nine, uh, 1980. So um, uh, what these agreements did, even though the big objective 
declared objective was to liberalize, they were rather more market management agreements than actually liberalization agreements, but they still tried to find the kind of balance between the interest of export exporters and the, um, let's say, competitive exporters and others. So um, dairy agreement was, there were at least some more substantive clauses, which was notably dairy agreement established uh, minimum export prices. And um, actually these minimum export prices were obviously there to guarantee minimum revenue for exporters, but actually the, the, um, the behind the scene, a real reason was to find, fight against export subsidies by other countries given that some countries subsidized at the time very heavily its exports, so they wanted the, the, the agreement set the minimum export prices to make sure that these, those who subsidize can't go below a certain limit. Now, the dairy agreement was uh, much weaker, so basically it provided for, um, uh, for the place to where the importers, exporters, members come together and discuss the issues, but there was no substantive really provisions. Um, so, but one can see especially the dairy agreement as an attempt to, to take forward a product specific issue, even though it was not necessarily with, a, with the aim to liberalize, it was more to manage, manage market and manage the surplus and manage the shortages. That was the declared aim. So, um, so these uh, agreements were uh, basically um, uh, scrapped in uh, the, so uh, few, two years after the, uh, the end of the Uruguay round. And among the reasons uh, why they, they, uh, um, they were terminated was because first, um, uh, first they were not enough, uh, many, key members uh, didn't sign to these agreements. Uh, the cost of managing the agreements were apparently 50% of the uh, uh, funds for the AG division went into managing these agreements. Uh, and uh, and all at the, when uh, actually uh, the, the prices of these products um, dropped uh, members who were part of the agreement, some members no longer respected the uh, minimum export prices because there was no enforcement mechanism. So, um, uh, so there was no reason and the, uh, with the Uruguay round and agreement on agriculture, there were so many new commitments that it was addi considered additional burden and members decided just to integrate everything, uh, uh, drop these agreements and bring everything under the AG agreement. So just to, for conclusion, I have 30 seconds to do it probably, um, as I was told. Uh, so uh, it's the Uruguay round considerably reduced the policy space uh, and reduced the number of tools. Obviously, we know that some trade distorting measures are allowed because members consider, consider that they need it. Um, so it's up to the members really to decide now what they want to do with this policy space. Do they need the policy space? Policy space, policy space as it is, can they reduce, can they make, uh, restrict uh, somehow the use of some of the most trade, trade distorting measures or set limits over? Uh, I wanted just to point out also that in ag, we talk about distortion in the ag uh, sector, but let's not forget that in agricultural production, some distortions may come from other sectors such as services. Uh, that have an impact, um, uh, obviously, on, uh, on agriculture. And the, the question, and I finish with that question, is also if nothing is done about this policy space, uh, are we going to continue trade policy measure-wise uh, with status quo, or are some countries actually going to increase their subsidies or tariffs because they still have some room, some water. So, so if you go with, on with status quo, that's one thing. If we move to more, more protectionist world, that might be another thing. And I finish on that. Thanks a lot, uh, Ulla. Um, let's uh, uh, move straight to our last uh, speaker, Jonathan. Um, who's going to look at uh, 
some options and possibilities to uh, address the concerns we've discussed in, uh, in future discussions. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, I think we've had some very uh, rich presentations from our other speakers on the panel. So, and actually, I, I don't want to speak for too long because I'm really, um, as much as anything else, interested in hearing from, from you what you have to say about this particular question. How might WTO negotiations improve the functioning of agricultural markets in the future? But um, just a, f a few thoughts on that, uh, first of all. So um, I guess what we're trying to do with this process is um, to try and uh, help with the brainstorming and exp exploration of the different possible options. We're not trying to push the negotiating process in one particular direction or another, but rather help people think through some of the different issues on the basis of evidence about what markets look like today and what they may mean for food security and rural development. Um, clearly, uh, members have their own process around this. And uh, in fact, we have. Um, this very comprehensive set of questions that has been tabled now by different members and which the chair has compiled, the COAS chair, uh, Ambassador Vangelis Vitalis, has compiled for the July meeting of the, of the group. And um, there are many, many of the things I'm, I'm going to say sort of draw on or relate back to, to some of the questions in that document. So. As I said, I think it's it's very important that countries go back to the data, they go back to the evidence about what markets look like today, which are the products uh, that are distorted, which are the policies that are significant, which are the countries that uh, do have policies that are having an impact on other countries' um, imports and exports and uh, production and consumption patterns. So, and as Gerard has shown quite uh, quite clearly, there are five or six products that are heavily traded where countries do have uh, strongly distorting impacts on their policies. I think Gerard mentioned rice, maize, pork, beef, and dairy as being right up there in the first tier of products that are of, uh, of interest from that point of view, but also wheat and sugar fruit and vegetables, poultry, cotton, and soybeans. So we've got something very specific and very concrete to start with there. Um, and uh, Ahmed has also talked to us about what these products look like from a food security perspective, um, which products are important in terms of what people actually eat, what is relevant from a nutritional point of view. I think it's also important that we bear in mind uh, the importance of trade and, and um, production and consumption when we look at agricultural products from the point of view of incomes and rural employment as well, which can also have a knock-on impact on food security through the impact they have on uh, access to food. So if you're producing cotton in Mali or you're producing cut flowers in Kenya or, I don't know, biofuels in Argentina, the policies that have an impact on uh, global markets may have an impact also on food security in your country, not just through the impact on the availability of food products and agricultural goods, but also on the ability of people, especially poor people, to be able to earn enough to be able to buy food. So I think this is also a relevant sort of conceptual ingredient to our discussion that we need to keep in, in mind. How do we go about addressing all of this in the negotiations? Of course, there are different options uh, that are out there. Some of the, of the approaches have already been uh, explored, uh, either in the, the chair's document in July uh, or in the modalities text in the past, or even, as Ulla said, in, in various other iterations of the um, attempts to dis discuss and explore meaningful ceilings, um, more meaningful disciplines on some of these distortions in the multilateral trading system to date. Um, people have talked about uh, general ceilings uh, and caps on domestic support, uh, either specific for specific categories or for overall trade distorting support. Uh, people have looked at product specific limits, and there are other options which can be explored which maybe are not part of the set of issues that people have looked at so far. And maybe people can also draw inspiration uh, from some of the things that have taken place in the past and look uh, creatively at how we can uh, l look at those same issues in the future. So Ulla mentioned the plurilaterals for, for dairy and for beef and commented on the extent to which that was um, significant. 
in the past. Um, we've also had the Geneva Agreement on Trade in Bananas, which is a, a particular agreement um, that's, uh, that focused on a particular product in a particular area that was of concern. And also, of course, the cotton negotiations, which have been a significant focus of many members' efforts over the last several years. Um, while much of our discussion today has focused on domestic support, uh, both uh, Jared and I think Ulla have, have emphasized the importance of going beyond thinking about domestic support when we're looking at trade distortions. And there may even be creative options that people can explore for um, addressing distortions across a particular product uh, or a particular market, which involve thinking about uh, multiple elements or multiple ingredients, whether it's some particular market access concessions, such as improving TRQs in exchange for something on domestic support, or other possibilities, uh, export restrictions or whatever. Um, so I think just to conclude, uh, certain products like cotton or bananas and sugar have received a great deal of attention and analysis over the last few years, other products slightly less. ICTSD has been one of the places that has been doing some of that analysis and research uh, in conjunction with other partner organizations like FAO or OECD, uh, WTO. There are lots of places that are looking at some of these issues and of course we can continue to, to deepen analysis in particular areas if it's felt that that would be useful in the future. Um, so w with that, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up my comments and I'd be very interested in hearing from people in the room today uh, on what their thoughts are on, on how we might go about answering this particular question, hopefully in a very sort of uh, uh, free-flowing and uh, engaged sort of way. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, Jonathan, and uh, this uh, puts an end to um, the series of introductory remarks and, 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 and speeches. Uh, so uh, with this, let me open the floor for uh, any questions, uh, clarifications, remarks, or comments that uh, people may have.